Hi everyone, welcome to the first session of Learning How to Die, Socratic Discipline and Philosophical Life, Part 2, by Daniel Sassilot. The seminar for examines the systematic integrity of Socratic thought and this in its theoretical and practical aspects. After our excursion in the last day of Socrates, in which philosophy becomes explicitly definite as the art of learning how to die, it is the second part of the seminar confronts key middle and late Platonic dialogues, the Theatetus, Sophist, Parmenides, Philebus, and Timaeus. In these dialogues, as you see, Plato and Atticus profound elaboration of key metaphysical, epistemological, and ethical tenets of Socratic thoughts. Realizing the synthesis of Parmenian dialect and Pythagoreanism announced in the Phaedo during Socrates' final hours, escaping the perceived sexism of Heraclianism and its malign expression in Athenian democracy at the hands of the Sophists, this proposed synthesis of dialectics and a mathematical realism and becomes key to transforming the Socratic conception of the philosophical life. In this way, we shall see Plato's articulation of truth, beauty, and justice reflect not transcendental metaphysical platitudes, but the systematically cohesive regulative ideals organizing the intrigative of speculative, aesthetical, and ethical political foundations of, uh, of thought. We sh you shall according observe how Plato confronts a series of perennial philosophical questions and problems, the articulation between being and becoming, the dialectical tension between which is and is not, the one and the many, the analytical procedure of method of division, and its articulation with the synthetic method of the dialectical ascent, the relation between pleasure and knowledge, and the informal ethical reason. Along the way, we are engaged in the continuous assentment of critics and appropriation of Platonism since the modern period until today in different strands of materialism and realist thought, from dialectical materialism to extraterrestrial psychoanalysis, neurotionalism, structural realism, and speculative materialism. Daniel Sassilotto is PhD in Comparative Literature for University of California, Los Angeles. His research focuses in the fields of contemporary philosophy and Latin American literature. In particular, his research focuses in reconciliation of rationalism and materialism and the methodological relation between epistemology and ontology in contemporary philosophy. He is currently finishing a full length monography that will be titled Saving the Noumenon, an essay on the foundations of ontology, in which he proposed a critical reading of ontological turn in contemporary philosophy and lays the foundations for a new transcendental epistemological shift and spirit in the, uh, in the works of Rufat Sellers, Robert Brandon, Alain Badiou, Lawrence Pontel, Ray Brassier, Hazan Agaristani, and Jay Rosenbeck. Daniel? Uh, thank you very much. And I presume you're Bruno, right? Yes. Or, yes. Yes. A uh, pleasure, Bruno. Um, that biography is a little outdated. <laughs> I need to update it. Uh, so yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, most of you, I believe, were here for part one, right? Except, uh, is is there anybody here who wasn't here for part one? Maybe maybe uh, Yoel. Right. Right. Cool. Well, that's gonna. I mean, I'm still gonna have to. Uh, do introductions for the purposes of uh, you know whoever happens to join after, because um, there's more people supposed to to come in, so they might just show up uh, later or in the next session or and so on. Um, but it's good to see you all uh, return, which is which means that something went okay in the first time. So uh, before we get to, to 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 business today, just just to cover the obvious logistics uh, stuff. So. We will be doing going over the, the workload stuff at the end of the seminar today, uh, as usual. It will be very similar to the first seminar where we will arrange to submit presentations and papers at the end, as opposed uh, to middle of class, just for, for time's sake. Um, and other than that, I think, let to just begin, let me just make sure that the syllabus and the all the readings should be now uploaded in the drive. Um, again, it's the we're using the Plato Complete Collected Works uh, collection that uh, is already uploaded in the drive just for matter of consistency and style. 
Um, for those of you who weren't here, I mean, Yoel, that's, that's you right now, but anybody who's watching this, uh, in case you didn't attend the first part of the seminar, uh, even though it's not mandatory, right? Um, it's, it's, it's highly recommended because uh, especially for the introductory purposes. So today I, I'm going not to jump straight into uh, the Theotitas, which is the reading for today, but I will be rehearsing some um, points from the, let's say, first part of the seminar, the results from the first, first part of the seminar. But especially um, those of you who remember, or those of you who've seen the recordings, will realize that um, we, as usual, <laughs> as it tends to happen in these things, we ran out of time last time, right? Uh, a little bit, where we were uh, engaged in a reading of the Phaedo, and I was beginning to expand on the essential results that we were supposed to be drawing from there, particularly concerning the theory of forms. And I quickly, in the last hour and a half or so, try to like run through what I took to be the major results that we got there. Um, but it was a very compressed and rushed sort of exposition. So one thing that I will begin by doing uh, today is by going through that because it's going to turn out to be, and it was meant to be all along, sort of preparatory work to understand in more depth the, the materials we're gonna be covering in the second part of the summit. Now, with that in mind, um, those of you who haven't seen the, for whatever reason, well, it's been a while, so I, I wouldn't blame you if you do. If you don't remember very well the the, the where we left off, uh, I, I recommend you just like take a, a peek at the last session. And those who didn't attend at all last time, um, I, I really do recommend that at least you take a look at the first session and the last session, particularly since uh, the first session of the first part of the seminar went over the general concept of the class and also a kind of introductory sort of elevator pitch to the history of Platonism that for reasons of time and also because I wouldn't want the four of the people who were here in the first part, uh, which is a great majority, uh, I will not be rehearsing all over again, okay? Uh, it would also be just redundant, right? So that's already available. Um, so please do make sure that you access that. Um, but, and, but nevertheless, there are a few methodological points <laughs> and sort of overarching ideas that I do want to uh, begin with to, 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 to just get our you know, minds refreshed, as it were. So before we, we enter into today's stuff, which is the Theotitas properly, I am going to, uh, first of all, talk a little bit about um, uh, three, three points specifically. First, uh, just a brief reminder of the general concept of the class. Second, uh, kind of reminder of, um, and a little bit of more patient elaboration of our reconstruction of the theory of the forms. And the third aspect, which I only got to very briefly discuss last time, um, which is something that is important to my reading of Plato, is the theory of recollection stuff. Now, even though the theory of recollection takes place throughout Plato's dialogues in many places, among them the Mino, which we haven't read either in the first or second parts, um, I, I do have something that I want to say since it also uh, occurs prominently in the Phaedo, which we, was the last thing we read for the first part of the seminar, okay? Um, but before we get into that, the stuff, as usual, I'm going to ask our illustrious attendees and participants to introduce themselves just for um, this uh, protocol, as you know. So I'm going to just go quickly around and ask people to introduce themselves as usual. First, uh, Felipe, Felizardo. Hey, everyone. Hey, Daniel. Um, so um, I'm, I'm Felipe. I'm, I live in Porto. I'm originally from Lisbon in Porto. Um, I have no formal education, but, well, two years of the new center should count for something. Um, and um, uh, I'm, well, yeah, once again, I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Rachel, Cuba. Thanks. Hey, Daniel, it's nice to see you. Um, 
I'm Rachel Klipa. I'm from Pittsburgh. I'm an arts administrator, and I'm happy to be back for the second part of this class. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Will? Frazier? Yeah. Hey, hey, Daniel. Hey, everybody. Good to see you guys. Um, yeah, I'm a certificate student as well uh, at the New Center in Philosophy, and I'm currently doing a uh, my master's uh, at the CRMEP at Kingston University, so I'm based in London, although I'm in a hotel in Oxford right now. Um, but yeah, I'm ex extremely uh, thrilled to be part of the course again. Um, looking forward to your book as well, Daniel. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, Aaron? Hello, everyone. Hi, Daniel. I'm Hello. Aaron. I'm uh, coming to you from New York. And uh, yeah, happy to uh, be back. It's been a while and to be among uh, the friends of, friends of the ideas. No enemies of Socrates in this, uh, in this class. This is, this is a church, not, not a class. And finally, Yoel. I'm a bit in a messy, in a messy situation, I'm sorry. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a product designer. I also finishing a master in philosophy. I postponed, I postponed my, my last year, last time, and I didn't take the first part of the class, but uh, somebody told me that it was great. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to see what, what, what's going on. Fantastic. Well, welcome. Uh, nice to have you here. You have just, uh, since you're the, the one soul here that wasn't here in the first uh, part, please do try to uh, review the first session and the last session of the first part, which is in the archive, okay? Just for future reference. So. Some of, the stuff, some of the stuff that I might say, especially the, the, the stuff that I will begin by saying, uh, might be a little aloof. So uh, in, in case, if that's the case, then just make, make sure you reference that first part, right? Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, everybody, uh, for, for returning. Uh, everybody knows me. I'm Daniel Sassolato, obviously, an instructor for the class. Um, and yeah. That's it. Uh, just one more uh, proviso, and we'll get right started with two things themselves, with them, with things in themselves. Uh, I've been with COVID the uh, whole week uh, for I don't know how many times I've had COVID at this point. Uh, but it's uh, so I'm still a little congested, as you might be able to, to to tell, and I've been recovering and not sleeping all that well. Not that I ever sleep very well, but. Uh, so please do forgive me if I'm a little slower than usual, right? Because I'm obviously been uh, a little out of it for the last week, okay? But with that said, I, I think we're good to, to get started. And <clears throat> you know me, I'm going to be uh, you amply using the resources of PowerPoint to help us guide our way. And uh, without further ado, let me just uh, get started. One, oh, one more thing. Because I am congested and because I've been struggling, and usually I like to plow through and not give anybody a break, you know, and because and, uh, we're troopers here, there's no need for rest, right? Um, today we will pro we'll probably need a break at some point because or, or else I'll pass out, okay? So let's get started without further ado. All right, so part two. And ta -da, right? reload it, or however you want to call it. Hard to. And um, to get us started, I'm going to begin actually with a, with a little story, uh, which is cute always, right? I, I always like to, I'm, I am at the end of the day a, a student of, of Badiou, right? And um, actually, I remember I told you guys that the, the whole concept for the summoner actually began as a sort of answer to an existential crisis that I was going through. Uh, way back when. Anyway, but uh, there's, I, I was actually thinking about this afterwards, and I, I don't think I ever got to tell you the story, because if, if I did, uh, do tell me or remind me, because, uh, but in any case, I was actually uh, talking with a friend who was asking me about when was that philosophy really began to be a thing for me, right? And of course, I, I, I started thinking, well, you know, really, I was reading already. I was reading stuff in, in high school, whatever, but, I, but then it occurred to me um, that the earliest experience that I can sort of date back to something like a philosophical awakening was actually quite early, quite, quite early in, in childhood when I was about, I don't know, three, four years old, something like 
And it was when I was living in Peru. I grew up in Peru, as uh, I presume most of you already know. And I remember I was uh, living with my grandparents, which I did. I was raised by my grandparents. And I was one night in bed. Uh, and for the first time in my life, the thought crossed my mind that I was going to die, right? Um, and my response was to start weeping inconsolably, right? I just started weeping and crying. So I was weeping in my bed alone, little boy at night, right? And then my grandmother um, heard me and she walks into the room and she sees me crying. She sits by the bed and she goes, hijito, hijito, right? little son, little son, why are you crying? And I tell her, well, grandma, because I am going to die, right? Now, my grandmother was a very religious woman. And if you were to imagine, right, what a religious grandmother would say to her grandchild upon hearing that he's, uh, you know, tormented by the idea that he's going to die, it's like he would say, oh, but don't worry, little son. Um, you know, you will die, yes, but you will rejoin, you know, you'll meet me because I'll be there. Um, you'll meet all of your loved ones, you know, in the afterlife, you live forever, you'll be, if you, if you, if you behave like a good boy, you know? um, but she didn't do that, you know, she, she said something quite remarkable, she asked me, what were you before you were born, and I started thinking, right, and I, and I remember, I remember this so clearly, and I told her, nothing, well, she said, then, that is what you will be after you die, nothing. And I remember at that moment, you know, that, I mean, that could have easily <laughs> gone south, right? That could have easily sent me into a further catastrophe. But I remember something very specific happening at that moment. The weeping stopped, right? And all of a sudden I became fascinated. I became struck by this idea that I came from nothing and that I would become nothing, right? All of a sudden, this tragic, you know, mortifying thought became wondrous. I think that this is exactly what the experience of catharsis is in the Platonic sense that I've been trying to elaborate. Catharsis, as we have been discussing, and as I mentioned in the first part of the seminar, is at the center of this interpretation of Plato that I'm proposing, concerns something like the purification of the soul from the body. That's, of course, its traditional conception. But more than that, it involves a rising or rising above the particular into a universal dimension. Catharsis is the mechanism or the means or the process by virtue of which we learn to step outside of our personal, individual, carnal arrest and access, learn how to access a dimension that is properly universal, impersonal, non-individual, and eternal. What was experienced as a personal tragedy or as a personal problem, I am going to die. I am afraid, became a, sor a source of wonder once it became plied, integrated into this universal horizon of question. From nothingness we come and to nothingness we return. All of a sudden, the fear of death was replaced by wonder, by a kind of endless wonder. And in this, I agree with my master, <laughs> Badiou, in that it is in this particular sense of catharsis that we should understand the Socratic function of the corruption of the youth. The corruption of the youth is to teach us that the philosopher's job is to teach the new generations of students that are coming to teach the youth, finally, that beyond the temptations, the pleasures, the allures, the tragedies and triumphs that they have access to in everyday life, that higher seductions exist, that there are greater ambitions possible, right? Badiou has a wonderful story in his lecture. Uh, I don't know if it's published anywhere, but it's called Philosophy as Biography. 
where he tells his story when he was a young boy, well, a teenager in uh, Algeria and in the countryside. And he would go into a nun convent to meet girls. And he would try to flirt with them by trying to convince them of the non-existence of God. And he says, the person who could argue persuasively for the non-existence of God was far more interesting than the person who could only offer a game of tennis. And then he weaves this to the Plato idea of the corruption, of God, right? So the job of the philosopher is now and forever to corrupt the youth, right? To corrupt the youth. And to corrupt the youth means to install or to instigate the process of catharsis or the feeling of catharsis, whereby we can integrate our lives into something much broader, much more general. Now, there is something connected also here to another concept that uh, is obviously familiar to those of you who are familiar with the work of Ray Brasi, which is a concept that he, of course, draws from Freud and from specifically beyond the pleasure principle, which is the concept of unbinding. In Nihil Unbound, as you know, Ray Brazier propose, proposes the fam famously that thinking has interests that do not coincide with those of the living. This is like the core hypothesis or thesis that grounds Nihil Unbound and his own reading of nihilism as a quote unquote speculative opportunity. And the idea is that the conditions for uh, nihilism, which is also the conditions for a philosophical realism, concern a kind of unbinding of thinking from its material, contingent, sensorial, experiential supports. But in other words, thinking has to think about a time ancestral, but also a future, which is beyond all life, the time of extinction, in order to think of materiality, of a materialism or a naturalism with full force. That in order to be realist, in order not to relapse to piety in the form of idealism or correlationism or anything of the sort, we need to unbind ourselves from the here and now in order to access a horizon of universality that is not accessible precisely from the purview of the here and now. Unbinding is something that, of course, can be traced back to the Platonic tradition and to the movement of catharsis. Now, last time, catharsis was introduced precisely as part of this purification of the soul in relation to the body, as part of the process of the philosophical ascent, which prepares us for death as a kind of asymptotic approximation to the ideal of wisdom which even though it is not possible to realize in life, we nevertheless can approximate it through the philosophical life. In other words, that the philosophical life is nothing but a preparatory sort of pilgrimage that lets us approximate the ideal of wisdom asymptotically, but nevertheless, wisdom as a whole cannot be fully attained in this life because we are always invariably contaminated with the body, with, in other words, the allure of the senses, with our base appetites, with the multiplicity of opinions which afflict our judgment. And in fact, hopefully, and I don't think there is, if there ever was a dialogue in Plato's work that shows the degree of contamination that one is subjected to that than the Theotetus. In the Theotetus, you see a younger Socrates time and time again arrive at a false place. He thinks and he offers to Theotetus, to the young, still impressionable, we suppose, Theotetus, a definition of episteme, of knowledge. And it seems like we finally succeeded at securing terra firma a sure ground, but Socrates time and time again tells us we haven't. Haven't you realized? We've relapsed to the old problems. We think we've, we've got into, and Socrates' discipline, Socrates' discipline of the young Socrates, nimble, right? At this, at this moment, relentless 
holy crap, there's no more fatiguing dialogue than the Theotetus, right? Like you can only imagine poor Theotetus at the end of that going home and being like, I'm never like, <laughs> you know, I'm never going to call. When they, when they tell me, come over, I just want to have a chat with you. I'm like, I, I can't start getting my, my, my mom has cancer, you know, something like that. But like, I mean, I can't imagine the TDs being anything other than plastered after that. Anyway, but the point is, this is the fidelity of Socrates, right? Socrates in the Theotetus is restlessly sort of capable of identifying that despite the impression of having arrived at a sure ground, he hasn't quite. And he keeps undermining his position time and time and time again. But we'll get there. The final introductory concept that I just want to throw back here uh, before going into uh, some more specific stuff is the concept of participation. And of course, the question is that in order to understand what it is that is eternal, universal, what is invariant, right, uh, throughout, uh, that subsists underneath the multiplicity of opinions, the flux of sensory appearances, right? We need to not only unbind ourselves from the body, but we need to understand how it is that anything in the material world, anything that is disclosed to the senses, anything that is the matter of opinion, finally can, if all goes well, participate in the invariant and the universe. In other words, one of the things that I was trying to remind everybody is that when you read Plato for the first time and the way that you rehearse Plato is in terms of a very crass dualism between, you know, usually the world of sensible appearance on the one hand, which is always subjected to flux and opinions, and on the other hand, the domain of the forms, which is eternal, unchanging, the forms are super sensible and so on. But of course, the problem with this kind of reading is that although there is a truth to it, of course, Plato does in fact draw a very sharp line as we saw last time with the, in the Republic already uh, in the beginning of the first reading we did in Republic 7 in, in sex already with the divided line, a sharp separation between the domain of the visible and the domain of the intelligible, right? And we, we went through the ontological and epistemological hierarchy. Nevertheless, this occludes the problem of participation. Because at the end of the day, it is not that the forms and the intelligible domain is simply amputated from the physical, material, sensory world of appearance, right? The whole point is to understand how it is that this flux of appearances nevertheless can participate in the world of the forms. How it is that the world, that the world of the forms informs, in other words, right, the way we experience the world so that we can in fact describe it, the world that we see in terms of concepts, in terms of general rules and principles that we can then, for example, explore through scientific study, through mathematics, through geometry, through whatever. Right? So the problem of participation is the problem of the articulation of the sensible or the visible and the intelligible. And this is where we will actually be beginning. We will be beginning by trying to take our cue back from the first part of the seminar to revisit the theory of forms. And I will try to go a little bit more in depth this time than I had time to do last time. And to begin with, I just want to rehearse uh, the central passage. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a long quote that I've just uh, divided into more readable fragments where this idea of catharsis and the idea of philosophy as the art of learning how to die with ease becomes integrated to this problem of the purification of the soul and also the access to the invariant structures that inform the material world. And this is where the famous passage of the Phaedo, where philosophy is the art of learning how to die with ease, becomes explicitly elaborated. So let's just simply rehearse this as our departure. There is likely to be something such as a path to guide us out of our confusion, because as long as we have a body and our soul is fused with such an evil, we shall never adequately attain what we desire, which we affirm to be the truth. 
The body keeps us busy in a thousand ways because of its need for nurture. Moreover, if certain diseases befall it, they impede our search for the truth. It fills us with wants, desires, fears, all sorts of illusions and much nonsense, so that as it is said in truth, and in fact, no thought of any kind ever comes to us from the body. Only the body and its desires cause war, civil discord and battles. For all wars are due to the desire to acquire wealth, and it is the body and the care of it to which we are enslaved, which compel us to acquire wealth. And all this makes us too busy to practice philosophy. Now, fantastic quote already, right? This, this reminder. Notice, now that we've read the Theotetus, how particularly this last part comes with a piece or is of a piece with Plato's indictment of the lawyers and the men of the courts that he elaborates in the Theotetus, which is actually at the center of this debate and is actually a final swoop that he will return to in the last part of the dialogue, as we will say. This is how the soul of a philosopher would reason. It would not think that while philosophy must free it, it should, while being free, surrender itself to pleasures and pains and imprison itself again, thus laboring in vain like Penelope at her web. The soul of the philosopher achieves a calm from such emotions. It follows reason and ever stays with it contemplating the true, the divine, which is not the object of opinion. Nurtured by this, it believes that one should live in this manner as long as one is alive and after death arrive at what is akin and of the same kind and escape from human evils. After such nurture, there is no danger, Simeas conceives that one should fear that on parting from the body, the soul would be scattered and dissipated by the winds and no longer be anything anywhere. Will the soul the invisible part which makes its way to a region of the same kind, noble and pure and invisible, to Hades, in fact, to the good and wise God, whither, God willing, my soul must soon be going. Will the soul, being of this kind of nature, be scattered and destroyed on leaving the body, as the majority of men say? Far from it, my dear Seves and Simeas. But what happens is much more like this. If it is pure when it leaves the body and drags nothing, nothing bodily with it, as it had no willing association with the body and life, but avoided it and gathered itself together by itself and always practiced this, which is no other than practicing philosophy in the right way, in fact, training to die easily. Or is this not training for death, right? This is the famous quote that I, would, that I wanted to go. And here we get the final chunk of the quote in which we get the articulation of this experience of catharsis, the purification of the body, of the soul, sorry, in relation to the body, which is the philosophical life, in relation to the theory of the forms. Do we say that there is such a thing as the just itself or not? Rhetorical as all. We do say so by Zeus. And the beautiful and the good, of course. And have you ever seen any of these things with your eyes? In no way, he said. Or have you ever grasped them with any of your bodily senses? I am speaking of all things such as bigness, health, strength, and in a word, the reality of all other things, that which each of them essentially is. Is what is most true in them contemplated through the body, or is this the position? Whoever of us prepares himself best and most accurately to grasp that thing itself, which he is investigating, will come closest to the knowledge of it? obviously. Then he will do this most perfectly who approaches the object with thought alone, without associating any sight with his thought or dragging in any sense perception with his reasoning, but who using pure thought alone tries to track down every reality pure and by itself, freeing himself as far as possible from eyes and ears and in a word from the whole body. Because the body confuses the soul and does not allow it to acquire truth and wisdom whenever it is associated with it. Will not that man reach reality, Simeon, if anyone does? Now, I hope that now that we've read the Titas, we understand that short of just some sort of facile spiritualism of some kind, right, in which pure thought is divorced from the body and from perception, blah, blah, blah. What really Plato's after here, again, this old Socrates, 
and boys, right, after he's gone through the pilgrimage, is actually an alternative account to the empiricist theory of knowledge, which is, of course, the fundamental or one of the fundamental uh, objects of critique in the Theotetus, right? The Theotetus begins, in fact, from the opposite thesis. This is the first definition of knowledge, as you know. Knowledge is perception. This is Theotetus's first definition, which, of course, he has acquired in continuity with the teachings of Protagoras. We'll have to examine that complicity between Protagoras and the empiricist theory of knowledge more closely once we get there. But here we see Socrates, the elder Socrates, now speaking with a measure of confidence and closure, no longer affording the hesitation, but also with a different kind of solemnity, right, than the young and tenacious Socrates, propose, in fact, the exact opposite thesis, that, in fact, the reality of all things, that which makes things real, is only accessible by thinking alone, without perception. It's, in fact, the diametrical opposite thesis of, empir of the empiricist thesis, right? And so the idea is, well, how do we get there? Certainly in the Theotetus, at the end of the dialogue, we don't get any kind of closure. This kind of proclamation that we see in the Phaedo is not afforded by the young Socrates. Not yet, at least. And I'll, I'll skip this part of the quote, um, just for time's sake, because we started a little late. <laughs> now, the other part uh, of the other dimension of the seminar that is very much at the core, right? And that I mentioned at the outset of the first part was that one of the things that I was trying to do was to propose something like a systematic reconstruction of Platonic thought. And by systematic reconstruction, simply I mean that the different quote unquote subfields or um, you know, disciplines of philosophy can be said to hang together in Plato in a very organic manner, in fact, where if you actually go through the different accounts that he gives uh, of ontology, epistemology, aesthetics, politics, and love, you find that there is a series of corresponding concepts that, that stand in strict isomorph and structural correspondence with one another. And I'm not gonna go through this in detail right now because obviously it would take us very, very, very long, but I think this is the most like sort of like, uh, you know, last time at the beginning of the class, I hadn't actually fully fleshed out uh, whether this actually worked for the aesthetics or the love part, but now I think it does. Um, and of course, with the aesthetics of love, which was the missing part, the ontology of epistemology and politics is very clearly mappable already in Republic Six and Seven, right? You can see this in the development from, on the one hand, the divided line, which is very clearly a, a sort of attempt to trace the correspondence between the ontological and epistemological, and then the allegory of the cave, to then the account of the education of the city. But uh, the aesthetics and politics come from two other dialogues. Specifically, you can see this hierarchical sort of correspondence. The aesthetics comes from the Eon, right, which is, of course, where, where Socrates has this, like, it's a, it's a very short dialogue, but very powerful with the rhapsode Eon, uh, the rhapsodes being the great reciters and interpreters of the poets, and Eon, who claims to be the great expert on Homer, right? Uh, and Socrates, of course, shows that there is a fundamental problem with claiming that uh, you can just be an expert on one poet alone, right? Like, you're an expert of, on Homer, uh, but I don't know anything about any other poets. I just know Homer really well. And of course, Plato's first and big problem is, well, how can you claim Homer is the best poet or claim anything about Homer when Homer speaks about war, about this, about that, when you don't know about anything else, right? Um, which is actually part of the epistemology, if you think about it, right? Like the holistic theory of knowledge, the idea that you cannot know any, anything in a vacuum. As well. But in this dialogue, the important part really is the famous magnet theory, right? Where he describes, uh, so Socrates describes, right? Um, how it is that in the realm of the arts, there is actually a kind of uh, magnetic chain of weakening or decreasing intensity of force, right? The gods inspire the poets, 
right? That's the first. So the, the gods know the message and they inspire the poets to transcribe the message of the gods, right? So we got from the gods to Homer, but then the poets are interpreted by the rhapsodes, right? And then the rhapsodes are interpreted by the audience, which is the, so in each step of the way, you have a weakening link. And it's very similar, this, this mirrors how it is that, you know, you begin from something that is, is strictly speaking beyond the sensible world, the gods, right? Which are like the forms who know the meaning of the poem. <laughs> and then you get to progressively a descent into the physical realm until like the prisoners in the cave, the audience members are just witnessing and interpreting whatever comes their way in the form of images, right? The love part comes actually obviously, where do you think in the symposium, right? And here you also have a hierarchy. Uh, in, 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 it's, it's one of the most beautiful and most classical uh, Platonic dialogues where you have also this kind of extraordinary uh, paradigm of the typical, one of the typical Socratic uh, things, which is this kind of pugilistic encounter between rivals, right? Where everybody sort of offers their own little little speech, right? Their own little reading of something. And everybody's like, wow, this one, it's almost like an anime, right? Where it's like a, a series of villains that comes each one stronger than before. And you go, oh my God, this is so good. How could anything top that? And then of course, Socrates comes and destroys everything, right? Like it makes everything else seem like, but what's also amazing about this, and in case you haven't read the symposium, I really recommend you do. It's not part of the reading because it's, uh, it's unfortunately not as fundamental for my purposes as some of the others. But one thing that's fantastic about the symposium is something that happens actually in a few dialogues, which is the party pooper Socrates, which is everybody's having a good time. Everyone's drinking, everyone's getting screwed up and just like, you know, talking and, and being you know, rambunctious. And then Socrates arrives and he's sober. He doesn't really want to drink, but he starts drinking. And then he gives a speech and he drinks everyone under the table, right? And then everyone's just passed out drunk. And Socrates is still up drinking at seven in the morning, right? With the few remaining souls that were maybe one remaining soul. And he's completely sober, you know, and still talking philosophy while everyone else is passed out. And then he just leaves and goes do his day, you know? Amazing. What, what, <laughs> you know, Socrates, the, the drinker. So, okay. So that's that's just to remind us that there is this kind of systematic attempt of reconstruction, and we will be seeing this attempt uh, even you know today very 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 clearly um, once we start getting to the theory of forms, which is my next point. So in order to get to the theory of the forms, I just have to refresh ourselves of uh, uh, our minds, especially for those of you who will be watching this but are unfamiliar with Plato, with just some fundamental concepts and some fundamental things that uh, this seminar is trying to disturb a little bit. And the first is that in the history of philosophy, Platonism is usually contrasted with two major positions. The first one is naturalism and the second one is nominal. Now in the traditional parlance, if you go to a, you know, your average dictionary of philosophy, right? Or you ask you know, your, your, your university professor, what is Platonism uh, usually taken to mean? it will usually be understood as a metaphysical thesis. Platonism, as and I'm just reading here, is the thesis according to which one is a metaphysical realist about an immaterial or supersensible class of entities, the forms or ideas, where the latter are conceived as abstract universals, qua theoretical entities, accessed by mathematical cognition. And in this sense, Platonism is usually contrasted with two positions, as I mentioned. The first, is natural. And naturalism is in this regard the thesis according to which one is a metaphysical realist about the entities described observationally and experimentally by the natural sciences and nothing besides. In this regard, of course, the great naturalist or the proto-naturalist is usually taken to be Aristotle, right? So the entire history of like academic philosophy in the 19th, since the 19th century and especially in the 20th century, since like the analytic and continental divide, 
can be seen as a kind of, you know, sort of attempt to, you know, uh, defend Aristotelianism, especially in the analytic tradition, right, uh, against the dangers of Platonism. And you, you find this as, in as early as Russell, right? And then the other position to, in relation to which Platonism is contrasted is nominalism. And nominalism is the thesis according to which there exist no abstract entities, but only concrete particulars. Now, beginning with these very cursory definitions, uh, I just want to say something that I said already in the introduction um, of the first part of the seminar, but something with regards why these two um, contrasts or antinomies or, or uh, you know, oppositions are actually ill found. Now, one very important detail, which pertains more to continental philosophy in this case. It's something that I'm sure you've all noticed since you are all avid readers of contemporary philosophy, which is, it's very interesting that today, it's actually, the things have been inverted, right? Uh, when you talk, especially in the continental end of the spectrum, it's funny that Platonism is now, um, you know, considered to be the sort of ally of materialism. Now it is like many people, including Ray Brazier, including Alain Badiou, right? Speak of Platonism as the condition, Joam Kopjak, Zizek, all those people. Everybody speaks of Plato as actually the person who holds the key to materialism. And it is precise because of his commitment to these kinds of abstract entities, right? that he is taken to be the ally of materialism. Now, think about it for the first time. Now, this, this doesn't make much sense, right? Because at the very least, the two world theory, the Plato that is presumably committed to abstract entities, that Plato would be committed at the very least to a dualism, right? According to which there's the material and then there is the forms or whatever, right? But in what sense could this be said to be materialist? Right? Why is it that Platonism would be the ally of materialism, right? And it is now nominalism that is oftentimes now taken to be the accomplice of anti-realism or of relativism. Now, there are very, very many dialogues in Plato where this particular uh, tension between nominalism and Platonism as understood in the literature becomes explicit. And not only in the, in, in, in the domain of metaphysics, but also in the philosophy of language, specifically in the Cortilus. But that aside, um, and I will have something to say about the Cortilus further down, further down the road, uh, which is a very important dialogue, I think, which unfortunately we, don't, we won't have time to read, but you know, we don't have time for everything. But this is something that I think is a big confusion, right? Because um, first of all, when we think about realism, both nominalism and Platonism are realist. It's just about different things, right? So in the classical sense, Platonism is a realist about abstract entities, right? Universals, the forms. But nominalism is also realist about concrete particulars. So why would, so this is the key, right? Why would anybody think that something like materialism would require Platonism? Because they think that materiality has to be defined in terms of theoretical unobservables, in terms of theoretical entities. In other words, that there is something to materiality that is unobservable by nature, right? And of course, this leads us to the second, which is why I think the point about how it is that today mathematical realism uh, has become sort of like the accomplice to materialism. This is not only true in the continental tradition, right? Of people like Badiou who are explicit Platonists, but even of course in the analytic tradition, there has been a resurgence of Platonism, which we briefly surveyed. And I've talked about this many times in my, in my seminars, which is how it is that actually already, you know, really since the sixties, already with people like Quine, right? You have this kind of idea that, well, actually, if we want to be naturalists, if we want to be good materialists or even physicalists, right? We need to accept the reality of abstract entities, at least things like sets and classes, 
right? Which are just, strictly speaking, theoretical entities, unobservables, right? Because scientific descriptions of the world, you know, uh, of our quantum universe and everything besides, depend on these mathematical descriptions and entities. So we can't do without them, right? So the irony becomes that not only to be a materialist, you need to be a Platonist, but to be a naturalist, you need to be a Platonist, right? And in the, of course, in the, in the continental tradition, already in the great structuralist sequence of philosophy that begins in the 60s, to which, of course, people like Zizek and Badiou are, you know, hires, right? We see the idea that, in fact, structuralism is the key to materialism because it is only structuralism that provides an account. And this, this you see very explicitly in the work of Lacan, right? The idea that formalization gives you access to the real beyond the vagaries of the imaginary, beyond the delusions of the imaginary. And philosophers who appropriated this Lacanian trope, right? Also, which, which you can also find morsels of in the great uh, epistemology of science tradition of French early, you know, Bachelard and so on. Uh, you, you see this idea that formalis mathematical formalization is the key to understanding the nature of materiality. So there's this idea that in order to get beyond phenomenology, in order to get beyond the vagaries of experience, right, which was, of course, the dominant trend in, in philosophy coming from Sartre, Margot Fonti, and so on, we need something like a resolute formalism, uh, which is the structuralist thesis, which claims that, in fact, the real is only accessed through formalization insofar as it trivializes experience, right? And the most categorical statement that paves the way for this kind of structural materialism in the continental tradition that comes downstream from the French post-war era is to be found in Lacan's, uh, well, obviously in, in Seminar 20, right? Where he has his most categorical statements concerning the necessity of formalization in order for the discourse of analysis to come up the ground. Now, it is also important, however, to know that this idea that you hear oftentimes that if you're a nominalist and you're a relativist or something of the kind, this I think comes from a, just a, you know, being philosophically benighted, right? Because there is a variable tradition of materialist nominalists, right? Who claim that you in fact can do away with any kind of talk of abstract entities. Sellers, Wilfred Sellers, is famously, a, you know, resolute champion of, of nominalism, and he's an enemy of Platonism, right? Um, now, in a very specific sense, right, in the philosophy of language. But he denies the being of abstract entities, including universals, but not only universals. He, in fact, denies even the existence of things like facts, which he thinks are already sorts of abstract entities. Why this doesn't need to concern us right now. But you can be a materialist and a nominalist. Again, nominalism only means that you're a realist about the existence of concrete particulars. That's all it means, right? So it's not an anti-realist. Uh, Felipe said, I think uh, that Gill fine book you share in part one maybe be added to the seminar draft for those who were in there. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. Yes, because that, um, that collection also has um, a really interesting essay on the two worlds. Well, it has more than one, but there's a very, very important essay about why Plato shouldn't be read along the lines of the two world theory. Blah, blah, blah. So this is, for all of these reasons, you can understand what also the contrast between Platonism and naturalism is finicky, right? Because it turns out that we understand that, in fact, it is possible to be both a naturalist and a Platonist. And in fact, not only possible, some people claim it's necessary, that in order to be a naturalist, you need to be a Platonist, right? Um, Plato, again, does not deride or deny the existence or the reality of the sensible world, but he tells us that the reality of the sensible world needs to be or is only made intelligible to us by understanding these theoretical entities. That in other words, the theoretical entities, the forms, right, provide the criterion of intelligibility for the sensible particulars that we talk about, negotiate about, and that form the basis of our everyday reason. Right? And this is where the theory of the forms needs to come in, because this is about how it is that 
sensible particulars can participate in these things called forms, right? Now, this is where we properly start. All of this was just like sort of quick review of things that I had already said. And the first thing that I want to put out here, the first puzzle, the first thing that should make you start to think, if you haven't already, um, is the following thing. Why dialectics? This is the first question that we want to ask. The forms are mathematical and dialectical. in nature. They are both understood in terms of mathematical formalization, right? They're amenable to mathematical description, but they're also relationally defined in relationships of consequence and contrariety, right? So the form of X is always something that specifies the necessary and sufficient conditions for X to be X. And these conditions also specify what X is not. Now, here is something that we need to understand from the get-go, right? This is, at the core, the thesis of modern science. We know this, the thesis of Mathesis Universalis, right? The thesis that, in fact, nature is written in mathematical language. That, in fact, the workings of the visible world can be described by a certain set of principles or rules, laws of nature, right? And that, in fact, the axioms and theorems and the rules of inference that make up a sort of theory of nature are is something analogous to a mathematical axiomatic. Now, I've said time and time again that Plato did not have access himself to anything quite as lofty as an axiomatic framework, right, to build the theory of nature. Newton hadn't happened. Modern science couldn't have happened in the time of Plato, right? But nevertheless, he's thinking about this, right? He's thinking about how it is that, in other words, in, to give a theory of nature, you need to have something like a comprehensive catalog of the laws of nature, of the basic principles that rule the visible world, in which everything that's visible, that's particular, that's concrete material participates. But the question is, why is mathematics insufficient? And why do we need the dialect? And this question, notice something quite important. This question lies at the very beginning of the Theotetus. At the very beginning of the Theotetus. How does the Theotetus begin? I mean, after we are introduced, you know, blah, blah, blah. When Theotetus arrives, the very first thing that happens after Socrates inquires and asks Theotetus to provide a definition of knowledge in general, Theotetus is going, and of course he fails to sort of provide a general definition. Theotetus responds in a kind of underhanded, with underhanded skepticism at Platonism. And he responds by saying, I don't know, Socrates, you know, in math, we have concrete problems and we have concrete solutions. Like, for example, right, and he goes into this little exegesis describing how it is that he found, um, you know, the distinction between finding the squares and factors of, uh, uh, you know, how do you call them, oblong shapes and, and equal shapes, blah, blah, blah. And then he says, you know, so that's a concrete problem. That's math. We know how to deal with that. But you're asking for something like knowledge in general. And I just don't know. I don't know how to even go about answering that. Right. And it's very interesting that Socrates is the and then, of course, what does Socrates respond? He responds by a digression, what seems like a digression, right, which is the midwife uh, analogy the philosopher midwife. This gives us the first clue to something, right? What is it that the philosopher brings that the mathematician cannot already do by him or herself? Why do we need the philosopher? And the answer to that is of course tantamount to asking why is there need, this need for the dialectic after mathematics? Notice something also that we remember, we, know, we, we saw this in the first part of the seminar. In the uh, educational program that Plato lays out in the Republic, between mathematics and politics lies the dialectic. The dialectic is after mathematics, but before politics, right? 
Why? What is the need for dialectics? Why do we need dialectics? That's the question. That question is the same as asking the question, why is mathematics not by itself sufficient? So in the Phaedo, we already saw there's this kind of return in this rehearsal of the theory of forms, right? And I think the theory of forms is, of course, where we're going to see this importance of the dialectical element. And also what the dialectical element finally is with more clarity. So in the Phaedo, we don't only get a description of what forms are but we get a clearer exposition of the dialectical articulation between the forms. So the first thing that we all know is that anything, anything that we can say is anything whatsoever, is what it is by virtue of participating in the form of what it is. So X, where X is a particular, is green, right? It has the proper green being green, insofar as it participates in the form of greenness. And the same for any kind of predicate that you can attribute to any particular. Now, a very long and tortuous history of Plato uh, or, or question concerning Plato is whether every possible predicate has a corresponding form, right? Which seems to lead to a kind of uh, overflowing precocious ontology, right? Because you can multiply predicates ad infinitum, right? Since language is iterable ad infinitum, you can define, you know, so if you can describe, you know, a predicate, you know, with 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 an, with invention of a word essentially, then you have an infinite number of forms. Is that a problem by itself? Would Plato admit that? It's not a problem that I'm particularly interested in. I don't think it really gets us to any interesting ground. At least I haven't been able to get to any interesting ground. But here it is, what I really want to focus on is how it is that this dialectical supplement becomes clarified. And my thesis is the following one, to give you the straight up. The reason why we need dialectics on top of mathematics is because dialectics provides the conceptual counterpart to mathematical formalization. Mathematical formula, formulae, are by themselves inert. You can perform calculations, but they are bound to all kinds of interpretations. You can be the best mathematician in the world. For example, your name could be Theodorus, and you could be a great geometer, for example, and you could be completely beholden to the grip of the sophist. Being a good mathematician doesn't make you immune to the allure of the sophist. Doesn't this give us another clue to the thesis? Doesn't it? The old Theodorus, the old geometer, wise, a perfect mathematician, but nevertheless under the grip of Protagoras. And of course, what is Socrates' job in the Theatetus? But to save Theatetus, from falling into the same fate. The dialectic is necessary because it does not only provide a conceptual supplement to mathematical formalization, but it enables us to understand the rational integrity of mathematical formalization. It is not enough to have the maths. It is important to also have the conceptual armature that corresponds to the math. Now, of course, the question is, what the hell is that structure, if there is such a structure? So there is something, and this is the, 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 the next point, there's something about the dialectical supplement to mathematics that is essential in order for philosophy to separate itself from sophistry. We need dialectics in order to understand why mathematical formalization alone is not enough to get us rid of sophistry. So let us begin with the forms and we can begin to understand this more concretely. So for, first of all, for forms have two obvious features. These are widely agreed upon in the literature. 
What comes after is more a matter of debate. But the first thing is that they are universal. And they are universal in the set that they describe a set of invariant features or properties across a class of possible actual particulars. And the second of all is that they express a perfection that is not seen in empirical particulars. So here is the obvious example. You have two empirical triangles, right? And then we have the form of the triangle, which is the formula. I don't need to actually spell out the numbers here. Now, you all know the examples from everyday parlance. You can draw a circle, right? But it's never quite a perfect circle. You can draw a triangle, you can draw, you can find geometrical shapes in nature. And in fact, we use these formulas, these mathematical operations to gain a measure of control over the material world, right? We build bridges and, you know, uh, columns uh, using principles that enable us to understand the mathematics and the geometry of cylinders and this and, all, and much besides. But of course, we understand that this is to an approximation, even if it's to a very close approximation. But the form itself, the formula describes the paradigmatic case, a case in which there are no anomalies, there are no deviations from the standard, right? The form of the triangle gives us the formula that applies to every possible well-formed triangle there is, right? So in fact, the form gives us the rule that enables us to treat every particular case. If you know the form, in this case, the formula for how to uh, calculate the length of the hypotenuse, right? You are going to be able to do so for every empirical case that comes your way, right? The form provides a key to gaining access to knowledge of the particular. Now notice also that for play, I mean, and this is already kind of like getting ahead of myself a little bit, right? But it's important to notice. You can have two, you can ask yourself the question, okay, but how do we arrive at this form or at this formula, right? Ah, form, formula, right? Is it by actually encountering a bunch of empirical triangles and getting out, you know, and calculating the hypotenuse and then realizing that there's this formula? Is this is how we do it? Or do we begin by actually forming a formula and then applying it to particular cases and realizing that this formula works? What's the order of um, acquisition? What's the genetic order, right? One seems empirical in, in, in tenor, the other one seems rational or rationalist, right, in scope. But that's just a sort of like intonation. Now, Beyond universality and perfection, which I've already described, I think there are at least seven basic properties. I will expand on these, and then after this, I will make a short break just for first sort of like get together. These are at least the first properties that I can identify, and I think uh, Plato identifies concerning forms. The first two I've already mentioned, universality and perfection. So first, let's just go through them just to have clarity. Universality forms specify invariant features of any particular that participates, in it, right? So every square is the sum of the square of its length and the square of its width, right? The area of every square. Perfection. The forms specify the paradigm of the property. The form of greenness describes what it is to what it is to be green paradigmatically, right? So this is. You can also call this paradigm, you know, parad forms are paradigmatic, right? They're paradigms. They're monoidetic. They specify one quality of essence. So the form of beauty is not the form of green beauty. There is the form of green, there's the form, the form of beauty. So that you can say that there is one predicate per, per form, and these are simple predicates, i.e. non-decomposable. Right? Not adjectively qualified either. They're monoidetic. Eidetic, of course, comes from eidos. Self predicating is the form. They exemplify themselves and they do so, of course, paradigmatically. This is, of course, the famous idea that Plato oftentimes repeats that only a form is the paradigmatic example of itself. 
only beauty is beautiful and only beautiful, right? Only truth is true and nothing but truth, right? And so on and so forth. They are five. They are self-caused. Auto, cat, auto. They are under eye. So beauty emerges from itself. Truth emerges from itself. Now, here there lies a potential point of either conflict or exegetical difficulty, which is that sometimes Plato seems to indicate or, or suggest that all forms must ultimately derive from the form of the good. But the question there is, of course, a question of what kind of priority the form of the good has in relationship to the other forms, and also what kind of relationship the forms have to the form of the good, other forms. Is it a relationship of identity, finally, where the form of the good is identical to all other forms? Um, we explored this possibility last time. Is it uh, one of hierarchy, where the form of the good is some kind of like meta form that is somehow the, the, the father form of all other forms? Is it a purely epistemological uh, relationship of priority? That in other words, to understand the other forms, we need to understand the form of the good. We're going to get to something close to this. I don't know if I have a like totally satisfactory answer, but I definitely have something that I can say about this. Property number six is that forms are the cause for any particular to have any property whatsoever. They are causal. So they make partic particulars that participate in them share in the quality that they specify, however imperfect. So if X is a particular and X is beautiful, X is beautiful if and only if it participates in the form of beauty. In other words, any particular that has a property P has property P only insofar as it participates in the form that predicate P corresponds to, the form of P, where P could be green or lion or whatever you want, right? Notice that this means something quite interesting about particulars that is different about the forms. The forms are monoidetic, and forms do not stand in relations of participation to one another, which is not to say that they're not related. What is the relation between the forms is the next, what I'm gonna to get to in the next part. Whereas particulars that participate in forms can participate in more than one form, obviously, right? So particulars can participate in more than one form, but they can only participate in forms and therefore evince or exemplify the quality specified by those forms in perfect. Whereas in contrast, forms are mono and they can only exemplify themselves, but they can do so paradigmatic. And that's the essential difference between particulars and forms, right? Partic I, mean, I hope that was clear, right? Was it clear? Is that somewhat clear? Okay, good. And finally, uh, there are multiple, right? There's an indefinite number of particulars that can participate in the forms. This is the other thing about forms. Forms have, they are, uh, they're uh, infinitely large wounds or sets. They're indefinitely open sets. You can have as many particulars as you can that participate. There's no limit in principle to how many um, you know, uh, particulars can participate in them. Although, although, you know, if you think about it, you can define a predicate that would entail a closed set, right? Um, arbitrarily so. Um, and you can ask, well, is there a form of that? If so, then there is then a finite number of particulars that can only, you know, belong to that side. But that, you know, that, that, that's a digression. Let me stop there for one second, first of all. Okay, cool. Um, first of all, these seven properties. Any, any, any questions or any uh, additions? Anything anybody wants to say? Does this seem like a fair roster of properties? Fair enough. 
or any thoughts. I mean, it doesn't need to be concerning the seven seven properties, which is wide open. Aaron turned on his camera. That means that we're one step removed from him unmuting his mic. Let's sure. go. Why not? Um, I'm just curious about six and the phrasing of it with caused, right? Yes. That they caused their particulars, right? Right. How, how careful should we be reading the, the verb caused there? Fairly, fairly carefully. You're right. I mean, this backs the question about what what sort of causality were involved, right? Mm -hmm. Because there is a perfectly uh, good sense in which it cannot be occasional causality in the sense in which this applies to physical objects, right? Obviously, since we, by hypothesis, are claiming that these um, forms are not, you know, one more element in the physical universe. They are not part of the sort of chain of cause and effect that obtains between particulars, right? So it can't be that kind of causation. It has to be a kind of ontological causation or condition, conditional causation that is metaphysical in scope or ontological in scope, but which is not material in scope. So a kind of metaphysical rather than physical causation, right? Mm -hmm. Now, how that metaphysical notion of causation is can be elaborated, Plato does not have a theory of that, right? Um, but of course, like contemporary metaphysics tries to, like, that is exactly, for example, how you think about, um, if you think about, for example, in modern scientific theory, right, and you think about something like a theorematic consequence of an axiom, or, or of a set of axioms, right, you have an, a theorem that follows as a direct consequence, right, of a set of axioms. You can say that, you know, there's a kind of causal relationship between the axioms and the theorems. In, in a kind of robust ontological sense, right? It is logical, obviously, since it follows, the theorem follows from the axioms, but it's also ontological insofar as the theorem describes something that's actually operative in nature, right? Now, this is, a, this is, the, this is not, of course, something that is like, you know, obtaining between concrete particulars in the, in the physical universe. It describes a general law, right? So, or a general principle in any case, or theorem. But that's the kind of causality that, that would be involved here. It's not something that obtains between two physical bodies, but it's something like a general condition that specifies what any kind of interaction between physical bodies can occur, right? Mm -hmm. So in this, in this case, it would be what is the kind of condi the general condition for anything to exhibit the property, whatever that property might be, right? Oh, that's great. That's all. Any other thoughts? This is a good good time to uh, get your throats moistened, your vocal cords in place. Help me out, me poor COVID-ridden Daniel with this foggy brain. Well, I do hope we get into the Timoch in the last session, but oh, yeah. uh, I'm really curious. Uh, where does that guy's uh, theorizing uh, connect to uh, what uh, what he's proposed so far in broad strokes? Uh, the what theorizing? Uh, that uh, dialogues uh, um, theories. W where do they connect with what you've uh, proposed so far? Uh, oh, you mean the the dialogues that we're going to be reading? Specifically, the the Timeo, the Timeos. In the Timeos, in the Timeos, yeah. we have well, the Timeos, is, as you probably know, is, is is Plato's famous theory of the world, and I have a very, as we're going to say, the theory of the origin of the cosmos, right? And in that regard, there's going to be a kind of almost, and this is to me why why I want to end there also. There's this kind of cosmological origin story which is oftentimes considered to be the most, the thing that you can just throw away. If there's anything you can throw away from Plato, is that, because obviously that's the, the thing that's been most sort of disproven by modern science, right? His, his cosmology, right? And I think there's something else there altogether, which is this attempt to sort of provide a kind of a structural realist, if you will, theory of the origin of the cosmos. 
which might be completely wrong concerning its particulars, but is completely right concerning its methodological positions, right? And we're going to see this. I mean, there's a text by Nathan Brown that I recommended, which deals precisely with this issue concerning the place of structure in Plato's Thebes, uh, which is why it's one of the recommended readings for that session. And we'll see that. Any comments or shall we plow on? Things are about to get a little thick. Okay. Are you also familiar with, uh, with Seller's essay on the Timaeus? Oh yeah, of course. It has some fun diagrams. It has some very fun diagrams. Yeah, yeah. I would I would recommend that, but that's like really, uh, it's it's not easy. <laughs> it's a really hard. I mean, not that anything we're reading is really easy, but that's a very. I mean, I couldn't even begin to like just to try to explain that would take me a whole seminar, right? It's 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 a, but it's amazing. It's an amazing. I think it's completely wrong, but <laughs> that's amazing. Anyway, um, let me let me keep going. Second. All right, so here we're going to get to. The, let me. Incidentally, a quick question: Can you guys see like a? Is part of the the PowerPoint blocked because of the the bar, or can you see the whole of it? No, it's all good. Okay, great. So I'm always trying to like move it. Anyway. So the first thing that I want to say is that Plato, in the theory of the forms, already anticipates a distinction that is explicitly elaborated in Aristotle, which is a, the distinction between contradiction and contrariety, which are in, in, in the famous square of opposition. It's, 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 it's legible, but um, I'm not going to use the word opposition in, in the traditional sense because uh, Plato is using it. You know, in, in, in specifically to to speak about contradiction, but each form admits of one contradictory or opposite term, but several contradicts. That's the next important point. So, for example, take the form of the odd. So, the opposite of the odd is the even, but Everything that participates in evenness is also incompatible and thus contrary to the odd. So, for example, three. The opposite of odd is not three, but three is incompatible with odd insofar as three participates in the form of, sorry, of odd. odd. I got it completely like screwed up here. You, you understand what I'm saying? So, Three participates in the form of odd, right? So it cannot participate in the form of even, right? Two participates in the form of even, and it cannot participate in the form of odd, right? And here is the, the quote, the, fam the famous uh, quote where he like lays this out. The triad, so take three here, though it is not the opposite of even, yet does not admit it because it always brings along the opposite of the even, brings along the opposite, right? And so the diet in relation to the odd, fire to the cold, and very many other things, see whether you define it thus. Not only does the opposite not admit its opposite, even odd, right? But that which brings al along some opposite into that which it occupies which it occupies that which brings this along will not admit the opposite to that which it brings along refresh your memory it is no worse for being heard of five does not admit the form of the even right in other words five cannot participate in the form of the even nor will ten its double admit the form of the odd why because five participates in the form of oughtness. And if five participates in the form of oughtness, then it would, and if it participates in the form of the even, then it would have to actually participate in two incompatible forms. And you can't do that. But the point, the simple point is that, it's a very simple point, right? Which is that uh, a, a single form might have one contrary, one opposite, but many contraries, right? And the contraries are defined by 
anything that would bring along, uh, that would participate in a form that is in fact opposite to whatever form it is. So in the case of five, it participates in the form of the odd, so therefore it cannot participate in the form of even. So this is the formal definition. If a form f of x is contrary to another form f of y, then if a particular x participates in f of x, let me just move this very quickly, sorry. Then if a particular x participates in f of x, uh, then it excludes participation in f of y. By the same token, forms are monoidetic but articulated in relations of consequence. So three implies odd. So if x participates in three, it participates in odd. And so it does not participate in either zero or even. So participation is a predicate that you predicate of any particular x is equal to p of x, right? So the, 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 the particular that is predicated, uh, the, the predicate that is predicated of any particular x means that the particular is uh, per, in the relation of participation, where this E here, the belonging sign, means that it belongs to the form of P. And this is the more expounded P, or the most expounded sort of formulation. So this is like a mock like formalization that helps us understand this in a more sort of like clean manner. So let's take the variables here, X, Y, um, although there's only X in this in this particular slide, to stand for particulars, concrete material particulars, the kind of things that nominals say are the only real things, right? Uh, nominalized expressions here, like three, even, and odd, are forms, right? And the operator E, or you know, the belonging operator in set theory here, just take it to mean the relationship of participation, right? So this is the relationship, right? So if a particular E participates in the form of three, then follows that X participates in the form of the odd. That's the first formula at the top. Now, next we get to the more, slightly more complicated cases, right? If particular X participates in the form of the odd, then follows that X does not participate in the form of the even, and it is not the case that particular X participates in the form of odd, that if, X participates in the form of the odd, then X participates in the form of even. And finally, if X participates in the form of, th of three, then follows that it is not the case that X participates in the form of even, and it is the case, and uh, I think something's missing, missing here, right? There is missing the X, uh, oh yeah, that's the person, <laughs> sorry. I missed the X belongs to, here we go. Sorry, this should be very quickly resolved. Sorry, I was like editing this at two in the morning. So here we go. Oops. Here we go. And it is the case that if X participates in the form of the even, then it does not participate in the form of the odd. Now, what this means is very simple, right? Is that Forms are essentially nominalized expressions. You nominalize the predicate, right? So, you know, three is a nominalized predicate. You know, odd is a nominalized predicate. They're taken to be almost noun-like expressions. And they stand in relationships of incompatibility and consequence, right? So this means that they mirror, in fact, the relationships that concepts, that is to say, you know, any kind of, you know, concept that we use in language stands in. So if you think about the predicate calculus, right, which is already anticipated in, in Kant, right, where you understand concepts as functions of judgment, right, and you can understand a concept as essentially, you know, again, for example, you take something like a concept even, right, you take it as a function f, and then you take particulars that you get from the forms of intuition as individuals, x, y, z, right, as arguments of that function and then what you get from the synthesis of the two is experience right that's the content theory well that kind of picture is very much here right the idea is that we get these particulars from sensory 
material experience from our interaction with the world, right? And then you have these functions, right, which are the forms, which essentially is what makes the individual acquire the quality that they have. Of course, the difference is because Khan understood this, you know, rather, and Khan understood this rather well, that in a certain way, the, the, the particulars that is being subordinated under the form is not only being subordinated um, conceptually, right? It has to already somehow be already formed in accordance with the categories, right? Um, Plato already believes this. In other words, the, the particular that participates in the form of the even does so not only because we happen to classify under the concept even because we happen to speak English and know math, it does so already before we are able to do this classification, right? There's a kind of ontological truth to this that is beyond the conceptual domain, right? So the analogy is very simple, like forms or ideas, however you translate uh, idos, are to concepts as particulars are to intuitive individuals in the modern theory, right? Now let me move forward. And here is uh, the famous quote from the Phaedo where you see this like expanded in a little bit more detail. Is it the only one of existent things to be called odd? This is my question. Or is there something else than the odd which one must nevertheless also always call odd as well as by its own name because it is such by nature as never to be separated from the odd? I mean, for example, the number three and many others. This is of course exemplifying the idea that there are many uh, not only many particulars that can participate in the form of the odd, but that there are a variety of forms that imply the form of the odd. Consider three. Do not think that it must always be called both by its name and by that of the odd, which is not the same as three. That is by the nature of three and of five and of half of all the numbers. Each of them is odd, but it is not the odd. Then again, two and four and the whole other column of numbers, each of them will not be the same as even, it's always even. So each of the even numbers, right, has a form of its own. There's the five, there's the two, blah, blah, well, uh, even numbers, sorry, two, four, blah, blah, blah. And all of them imply the form of the even, even though they're not the same as the even. So there's a relationship of consequence that is implied by forms, even though the forms do not participate in one another. And each form admits of an infinity of possible forms that are sort of, quote unquote, consequence of. So, you know, there is an infinity of even numbers that therefore apply the even or the odd. And then the second part of the quote, the form of three occupies, what the form of three occupies, right, must not only be three, but also odd. Certainly. And we say that the opposite form to the form that achieves this result could never come to it. It could not. Now, it is oddness that has done this. Yes. And opposite to this is the form of the even. Yes. So then the form of the even will never come to three. Never. Then three has no share in the even. Never. Notice that all of this, all of this is at the conceptual level, right? We're looking here at relationships of incompatibility and consequence between the concepts, odd, even, number, right, five, three, whatever. Here, you're not doing like mathematical calculations, right? You're simply doing like uh, inferences on the basis of what the concepts imply. Now, this means that there is a kind of correspondence relationship here that's at work, right? So to be able to map these inferential relationships between the forms, which are ontological valences, as we know in Plato, right? This means that in order to epistemologically have any knowledge of any of the forms, you have to have knowledge of the relationships of incompatibility and consequence that it holds to other forms, right? which means that you need to be able to map these relationships semantically into a semantic map. In other words, you need to be able to understand, to, in order to understand the form of the odd, 
you need to understand epistemologically and the semantically to be able to map the concept odd that, you know, that for example, if something is, if a particular X participates in the form of three, then it participates in the form of oddness. And therefore X does not participate in the form of even, but it participates in the form of number, right? Something like that. That capacity of semantic mapping that is not, again, strictly speaking, mathematical, says so all of what I'm saying right now is at the level of conceptual inference, right? Is something that is necessary in order to understand what the forms are. It's not just enough to be able to do the math in pen and paper with the numbers. It's important that you be able to actually track the conceptual concepts behind, right? The concepts to which they correspond. So again, knowledge of the form of say three entails mapping the conceptual semantic implications of the concept three to the concepts number, odd, even. And by the conceptual semantic implications, we mean the inferential relationships of incompatibility and consequence that a particular concept holds in relationship to other concepts and therefore to other forms. So this means that the forms are, there is a, and here you see again, this kind of systematicity, right? Or isomorphism between the conceptual order, the linguistic order, and the ontological order. There is a kind of symmetry between the inferential relationships that hold between our concepts, number, odd, even, which are expressions and language, right? In this case, English. Then, of course, the order of knowing, right? Which is how it is that we know the form of number and odd and even through this linguistic articulation and the forms themselves, which are ontological valences. The three are kind of like parallel of each other, right? So ontology, epistemology, and semantics are of a piece. They are strictly commensurate here. And this is, I think, the key to understanding precisely this dialectical subject. Right. And there is another dimension that I'm going to get uh, to next. The first thing which I already suggested is that dialectical knowledge implies a conceptual supplement to understand how it is that there is a conceptual rational order on top of the order of calculation. Right. And it's necessary to be able to articulate the semantic epistemological dimension to the ontological to attain dialectical knowledge. But the other part of dialectical knowledge has to do, of course, with selection and has to do with the idea of synthesis, the idea of being able to select among a series of candidates what's the right candidate, right? To be able to choose correctly among a variety of pretenders, right? And how it is that dialectics enables us to do this. One thing that we understand uh, and this is something that we mentioned briefly, right, was that the philosopher guardian, as described in the Republic, the ruler of the city, is someone who has to, by nature, have completed the education in dialectics, politics, mathematics, and then the primary education that comes before. And that at the end of this education, the reason why they would be best fit to run the city is not because of just some technocratic sort of criteria for, you know, who, uh, who is the best ruler, but because the dialectical formation at the very end, right, um, as a preparation for political training would enable them to be able to distribute in the city the roles that are appointed to each individual. So the same relationship that you see between the particulars and forms, you can think in the terms of the construction of the city, in terms of the individual citizens that are at the end of the day particulars, right? Um, and the different social roles that they can acquire. I am, uh, you know, a general, I am a fireman, I am a teacher, I am a this, I am that. The philosopher guardian is the person who is best fit to distribute the roles to decide which particulars get to be appointed to which of these forms. Hard not to see ruler as, <laughs> as <laughs> yes, that is actually quite right. Ruler as a measure, very platonic. 
it's a different it's a different way to to read this. Now um, here's the other part that is important to understand, of course, and this is something that for the first time I understood only by reading actually uh, Heidegger a, a, a while ago, which is that it's not only that there's this synchronic dialectical dimension to the forms that connects them, you know, conceptually in this kind of space of implications, right? In this kind of inferentialist, proto-inferentialist manner, right? But that there is a kind of diachronic living dimension to the forms. And this is where I think it's important to understand Plato's precursor of the kind of functionalist metaphysics that you get in Aristotle, right? So the concepts are always also conceived with the idea of production, not only in the sense of participation of something that is a synchronic relationship that's static, but it is what Heidegger calls a look in advance in sight of precisely a paradigm, paradigm to be realized or something that ought to be produced. A telos, right? This is the teleological aspect of the forms, right? The way that in defining a paradigm, a paradigmatic case, they also define the endpoint of a process, that ideal endpoint of a process of becoming. So this tells us something interesting, which is that forms provide not only uh, the idea that you know are the forms are not just theoretical entities that are invisible but are intelligible forms are visible in a way not in the sense that you can see them with your eyes but the, in the sense that they provide the criterion of intelligibility for anything that's visible the forms make anything that's visible what it is and therefore identifiable as what it is right so the obvious example, right? In order to be able to see the tree as a tree implies that in this sensory, in this perceptual state, right? There is the working of the idea of the tree, right? But the point is, of course, this is already a contaminated impure representation, right? Uh, which is after all the Hegelian conception, right? Representation is always impure. For Hegel, um, which is why it's always an, a mishmash of concept and, and perception. Okay. Um, and this, this is something that will reemerge as we'll see in the CT very, very closely. So here are the two quotes. We must rather interpret them, the forms, with a view to production. This is both from the basic problems of phenomena. Uh, what is formed is, as we can also say, a shape product. The potter forms a vase out of clay. All forming of shape products is affected by using an image in the sense of a model as guide and standard. The thing produced by looking to the anticipated look of what is to be produced, be shaping, forming. It is this anticipated look of the thing cited beforehand that the Greeks mean ontologically by eidos, idea. The shape product, which is shaped in conformity with the model, is as such the likeness of the model. And the second quote, the eidos, that which a thing already was beforehand, gives the kind of the thing, its kin and descent, its henos. Therefore, thingness is also identical with henos, which should be translated as stock, family, generation. That is the ontological sense of this expression, and not say the usual sense of the German Gattung, genus in the sense of a group or son. The logical meaning is found in the former. When he deals with the highest what determinations of being, Plato most frequently speaks of the geneton onton, the generation of things. Here too, thingness is interpreted by looking to that from which the being derives in becoming form. Again, this is a very verbose, typical Heideggerian sort of way of saying what we already said, right? Which is that the form specifies a kind of horizon for a morphogenetic process, right? So Plato is, even though very embryonically, right? And there's no, there's no, nobody's going to argue that Plato has like a very fleshed out theory of morphogenesis or anything of the sort. But the idea is just the forms are genetic categories, right? So that idos is in fact needs to be understood with henos and fusis, right? And it anticipates the idea of final causation elaborated by Aristotle, right? Where 
the formal cause of the being, which defines its quality or essence, is also related to an, a final causation or telos, which specifies the ideal endpoint of a morphogenetic process, right? So it is in this sense that I think we can understand also Plato as engaging in a kind of proto-functionalist sort of conception of the forms, right? Where you, you know, when you have uh, a function, and if you take the forms, no, this time no longer just as predicates, but as functions, right? And you take the particulars uh, as, you know, again, arguments of the function, the function describes the series of transformations which the particular undergoes in realizing this function, right? So the form of the tree in this case would be the function that specifies what the materials that are brought under, right? The material particulars that are brought under this process of growth from seed into plant, the branching of roots until it you know, grows and becomes a tree follows, right? The form of the tree is nothing but this kind of pregnant sort of morphogenetic dimension that describes the entire sequence that you would get from seed to tree. But then the question is, okay, now we have something like, right, uh, an, a, a complementary question to the dialectical question in relationship to understanding, you know, the forms in this kind of a purely mathematical manner, which is what would be the kind of uh, dialectical supplement that would sort of get us this functionalist ontology to a dialectical uh, level of comprehension. And I think that the answer there is going to come from algorithms, right? Algorithmic descriptions are a set of recipes that describe conditional rules that take you from a state, an initial state to an end state. So just like these relationships of incompatibility and consequence that we survey, track relationships between the forms that are synchronic. So you can describe the diachronic evolution of a particular that happens to participate in the forms in the sense of a series of algorithmic rules that describe the process by virtue of which it comes to exhibit the desired property or trait defined by the form, right? So you can just describe an algorithm that says how it is that you know, you get from seed to a tree. And this is a series of conditional rules that tell you precisely how you get from A to B to C to D, right? Now we have this, this already, this kind of functionalist dimension already in Aristotle's commentary. Um, and here we have a, a particular quote that is particularly interesting from Plato's nephew, from Spusippus, I think is how you pronounce him but he was actually the inheritor of the academy. And this is an interesting quote from uh, the 12th book of the metaphysics. Spusippus supposes that supreme beauty and goodness are not present in the beginning because the beginnings of both plants and of animals are causes, but beauty and completeness are in the effects of this. Now, this is interesting, right? This is kind of like confusing, right? Um, and we don't know that this is just Spusippus or is Pusipus' uh, development of Plato, or this was somehow you know, Plato's own view. But the idea is that these uh, realized forms, beauty, completeness, right, are effects, right? And they're not at the beginning, right? And so this means that forms have a kind of living dimension to this. Borges, actually, of all people, was someone who understood this, right? He says, well, yeah, I, have, I only came to understand later that forms have this kind of like living dimension. And this will become clearer, I think, once we, we get to the Timaeus, um, where you see this kind of like generative potential for the forms. For after all, there is a question always of if the forms exist in this kind of like isolated transcendental domain, right? And kind of more crass reading possible. How is it that we nevertheless get this kind of descent into the flux of the coming that is the world, right? Um, and that's, of course, not exactly the same question, but it is a related question, and we'll, we'll get to that as well. But, sorry, then can I interrupt? Yes, yes of course. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just curious uh, because 
I'm wondering uh, so far what you've said. I'm wondering if I'm hoping as well. This is not hostile to, um, uh, let us say, um, a, a conceptual account of the dialectic, because you've mentioned uh, a, a temporal account, you know, from seed to tree. But uh, and of course, Plato wasn't aware that well a, of these these sort of questions of where and when does a tree begin when. If we have to account for the bacteria in roots of trees and oxygen and all that, and yeah. so not forgetting that the forms are forms of the understanding. This was my Eureka moment during the recent reread of the Timaeus. It's explicitly said there are forms of the understanding. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. The question would be: uh, the teleology here uh, does not exclude. Uh, a conceptual uh, dialectics, right? Because otherwise, I see this this as very uh, as only a genetic account, as uh, as 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 closed, you know, as as that account of dialectics that uh, implies that well, yeah, things are begging to be developed, and there is only this necessary way for them to be developed. Um. So. Well, there's 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 a there's a question concerning how to understand the participative participative sort of uh, locution forms of the understanding. What what this of means, right? That that's one question. Uh, whether this means that the forms are purely conceptual rather than metaphysical valences, I think Plato, uh, at the very least, if that's the case, has very strong and very explicit claims that, that suggest that uh, the forms cannot be understood in a psychologistic manner. And you know, so, so if it is if they are of the understanding, it is certainly not the kind of understanding that you get in the modern period in something like Kant, right? Where it's actually a psychological phenomenon. It has to be something that's actually ontologically robust. That's one point. The other point, and I'm not sure I understand, uh, is, is the concern that um, this that the genetic uh, proto-functionalist understanding of the forms as having a kind of developmental dimension to them that explain the morphogenetic conditions for anything to become whatever uh, would be incompatible with with that's what I'm missing. You think that that would create a problem for what, or that would can you can you just clarify that 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 ascribing that kind of genetic dimension to the forms would 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 create a difficulty for what position or for what view? Yeah, that's what my question so question sounded like. But if uh, well, if that was the question, uh, I don't see any impediment from uh, the the. Um, the gen the the morphogenetic account to allow yeah. for uh, uh, an understanding. Sorry, I, I I'm lost in translation. <laughs> um, no, no worries, no worries. Please, please. Uh, yeah, th I think that that my confusion uh, stems from the fact that I'm well. I'm asking if if Plato. Um, is only proposing uh, teleology and excluding um, our minds from uh, from I the see, realm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. But, okay, okay. So let, let me let me see. I think maybe maybe this is your concern that if by characterizing Plato as a teleologist, proto-functionalist in this way, um, it seems to force him into describing this kind of rigid necessary universe of becoming as opposed to understanding the conceptual sphere as something that's dynamic and open ended something like that is that is that the case so okay so that's i think that's a fair question right like is it doesn't teleology uh, i mean if plato is a teleologist which i mean i think he is right <laughs> But in any case, but if he is a teleologist, doesn't this force him into this kind of rigid deterministic vision of nature, right, or something like that? 
Um, and also, well, I think he does believe that there is, first of all, this kind of, there are morphogenetic necessities. There are, you know, there are like logical necessities, ontological relationships that are, again, inferentially robust and tractable between the forms. Like, you know, if something participates in the form of three, it participates in the form of the odd, right? It's as simple as that. And that's that's as analytic as you can have it, right? Like that's like not a synthetic, a posterior right through. Um, but, but he does not think for sure that we have privilege access right he's and that this is going to be at the core of the theotitas right it's not that we just like oh well we observe the world and we just somehow represent the morphogenetic or the or whatever relationships there are right in fact that's the problem with the empiricist theory the problem with the empiricist theory is that from perception from sensory impressions you get somehow you know a kind of understanding or knowledge of wisdom and Plato is going to challenge that definition systematically in every way possible, right? Like he's going to actually demolish every variation <laughs> that you can spin out of that thesis um, all and throughout. So in any case, because we don't have privilege access, right? And because there is not a direct causal link between perception and understanding, you know, uh, how it is that, you know, the forms hang together and how it is that the relation of participation takes place or what the you know what kind of morphogenetic dynamics might might take place for a particular that's participating in a form to realize itself as that as belonging to that form participating in that form because we don't have privilege access it means we need philosophy right philosophy is actually a way in which we sort of recognize that there are rational constraints to investigation that are not just merely mathematical but conceptual, right? The philosopher is always there, like pulling the pulling the the curbing the enthusiasm from the kind of sophistic exuberance, right? But also we're going to see very importantly, there is there is of course uh, a, a kind of uh, tremendous contention here, which is that Plato's writing as if the distinction is not between two philosophical positions, empiricism and rationalism, but that in a certain sense, empiricism, the empiricist theory, is strictly speaking non-philosophical. And that's that's a big point, right? Why is empiricism not worthy of being called philosophical? Why is it not philosophically rigorous enough? That's going to be the question of the Tetis. That is at the at the core of the why the empiricist does not deserve the label of philosophy. It's a brutal claim, in fact, right? And this, of course, takes us to the complicity between empiricism, sophistry, and there's, let's say, okay, let me just like, uh, as a sort of like pop quiz, there's three pincers that stand in complicity in the Theotetus. One is ontological, the other one's epistemological, and the third one is rhetorical. So we've already mentioned the epistemological, empiricism. We've mentioned the rhetorical, sophistry. What's the ontological? What's the third member of this unholy anti-philosophical trinity? Or who's the name? The evil, the root, in fact, of all evil. The enemy of philosophy, of Plato. Think about the Theotitas. Protagoras, Theotitas, Theodorus, the empiricist theory, all of them are finally hostage to who? It is because of who, whose teachings that are that that, that this corruption takes. Heraclitus? Place. Yes. Heraclitus. Heraclitus. So we have a complicity between a Heraclitean ontology an empiricist theory of knowledge and a sophistic rhetorical uh, exercise. And we're gonna see that that leads in fact to a kind of relativism and pragmatism. So at the end, you can also throw those in there. There's a kind of like, you know, whole uh, roster of positions that 
fall into this fell swoop. Empiricism leads to relativism. It's in complicity with sophistry. It destroys meritocracy. We're going to see all this. Any other questions? No? All right, very cool. So let me just move forward uh, a little bit so we can get to the thesis. <laughs> all right. So hopefully that much is clear that the forms are holistic on the one hand, the holistic dimension I mentioned before, which is the way that the forms are articulated in relationships of incompatibility and consequence, which are inferential, that this implies a kind of mapping between conceptual order, I the order of ideas and concepts that we use in language, the epistemological order in the sense of how we come to know the forms, right? And finally, the forms themselves, the ontological order, right? So with these, and then there is the, the functional dimension, which describes the morphogenetic, the life of the forms, which would be describing the set of conditional algorithmic rules from which we get from, uh, from which a particular that is set to participate in a form uh, undergoes a series of transformations or procedural like changes that lead to its participation in that form. And so here we have a potential definition of wisdom qua dialectical knowledge, which is the systematic and holistic comprehension of the relations between the forms themselves, and I should add there probably, and of the uh, necessary relations between particulars and the forms. This is what we might want to call synthetic a priori sort of principles, right? And this involves mapping the inferential relation between the forms and thus between the crafts themselves. So the point here is that there is an isomorphy between ontological, semantic, and epistemic orders, so that the ontological relation between the forms mirrors the semantic relation between concepts in turn mirrors the epistemic relation between states of knowledge, which means, of course, that Plato is not only an ontological holist, but he must be an epistemic coherentist, a semantic and epistemological coherentist, which is to say that you cannot have knowledge of an isolated thing altogether, right? You cannot understand the form of odd or the form of three without understanding the form of odd, the form of number, the form of even. You have to understand what is you know, a consequence of a concept and incompatible with that in order to understand it whatsoever, in order to have any knowledge whatsoever. And notice that this is, in fact, something that is not domain relative. It is something that's completely general. Remember what I said a moment ago concerning the eon, the dialogue where Plato addresses the rhapsode. I told you that this dialogue begins with the rhapsode Eon, who again is under the allure of sophistry, right? To tell everybody that he's an expert on Homer, but he doesn't know any other poets because Homer is the best and so why would he even bother, right? And Plato says, well, how can you know anything about Homer and not know anything, not only about any other poets, but not know anything about the art of war and not know anything about this and that when Homer speaks about all these things. And you would think that you would need to know about these things in order to be able to evaluate whether Homer is in fact better than any other, you know, poet and whether what Homer is saying is in fact true or, you know, wise or not, right? But Ian, of course, has admitted to not know this. So understand this, right? Like this kind of criterion of dialectical knowledge or wisdom as being mapping this kind of systematic sort of integrity of the conceptual inferential order, which corresponds to the ontological order, which corresponds to the epistemic order, is the condition to be able to map a field of knowledge, and not only a field of knowledge, but to understand how different fields of knowledge interact. Once again, if you take the case of a whole uh, of a poet like Homer, right? To understand Homer, in order to evaluate Homer as a poet, you need to be able to evaluate the statements of the poet concerning the things that the poet speaks about, including things like war. But how can you assess Homer as a poet without understanding also the art of war, right? So there is necessarily a kind of like a demand 
of knowing more than just what you are specialized to do in order to be able to evaluate anything whatsoever. Knowledge branches out not only within a domain, but between domains. And the philosopher guardian, having been trained in dialectics, is the only person who has the necessary backdrop to then be trained in the political art of how to rule the city, because only the philosopher guardian can then navigate the multiplicity of bodies and assign the roles accordingly, right? This answers my valid formulation question. Okay, uh, I don't know how it did, but <laughs> but hopefully it did. Hopefully it did. So anyway, I was going to say a few more things um, about the the functional dimension, but this is the 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 last point I want to make about this 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 idea, and, and which I want to just relate finally to the idea of the uh, the form of the good or the idea of the good, however you want to translate it, right? So the reason why the dialectic is an intermediary link between mathematics and politics is because it provides this conceptual supplement and this systematic ambition or the systematic clarification of how it is that the forms hang together, right? So this is why there is a distinction also in the divided line, as you might remember, between the within, sorry, the realm of the intelligible, between the so-called analytical idealities and dialectic ideologies. The mathematician, you see, is capable of doing two things. Well, the mathematician in practice deals with concrete domain relative problems, right? They, 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 they have a series of, uh, you know, concrete questions that they address, they have concrete methods that they apply formulae, and they come to conclusions. But as everybody knows here, who's ever talked to anybody in mathematics or even very, very savvy students in mathematics, right? They do not necessarily need to know anything outside of their field of competence and they don't necessarily need to know how to interpret you know, the mathematics itself, right? You can ask a mathematician, do, do you accept a realist or anti-realist mathematics you know, discovered or invented? And they might have ne never even pondered the question, and that doesn't prevent them from being competent mathematicians in practice. What Plato is saying is that in order for there be to a kind of applied mathematics to the ruling of the city, right? You need to have dialectics because dialectics, dialectics provides this kind of conceptual supplement, which is required to get beyond the discrete domain of just calculation in order to this holistic and conceptual understanding of what you're actually doing. So what is the dialectic? Finally, if you want to like give a provisional definition, is this definition I have in the middle, which is the dialectic is the capacity to ascend from hypotheses that ground specific problems to the first problems or principles, sorry, that condition the possibility of the construction of specific problems. The selection between rivals and discern the invariant forms that organize concrete situations, right? So the idea of the good is, or the form of the good, is in this regard, the telos of systematization, right? Sometimes the idea of the good is understood in, in a foundationalist manner, as the kind of like first principle or something like that, right? But the idea of the good is something that would enable us, presumably, right? to sort of like deliver or organize or distribute all of the subsidiary forms and all of the subsidiary knowledge with a measure of control, right? So the philosopher guardian aspires to have the form of the good, which is of course, almost like the form of normativity itself, right? Good from bad. In other words, the, the capacity to select, the form of selection itself is what the telos of dialectics finally is, right? It's the end of inquiry. It's only at the end of inquiry. And of course, the end of inquiry is only an asymptotic ideal that can never be realized in this life, right? Now, the, the second point I want to make before we, we dive into the Tetitis in the last uh, part um, is this non-psychologistic transcendentalism. 
And I'm only gonna like uh, I'm gonna move quickly here because I want us to 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 get to this. And I also have to like uh, leave the last five minutes just for logistics. Um, so first of all, the other part that I I already announced in the first part of the seminar is that there is a there's a transcendental dimension to Plato, right? But of course, if we understand transcendental, we can understand transcendental, at least in a psychologistic dimension. Now, the first thing to say is that oftentimes when you think about the paradigmatic transcendental move is Kant, and the way that the transcendental sort of era begins in the transcendental system in Kant begins is by a process of introversion or inflection. Kant, it is usually said, takes the Aristotelian scholastic framework of the categories, which was used originally as a metaphysical framework to describe being for being, and inflects it into the understanding, right? The categories become categories of the understanding as opposed to ontological categories that divide being for being. Okay. But notice that Kant also has a complementary introversion, right? Which is that he introverts the forms of intuition, right, space and time, which are precisely mathematical, right? He does not only interject the categories of the of being qua being, which are conceptual, predicative, right? But he also introverts the forms, which are mathematical in nature, right? And as you know, in Kant's theory, space and time are subject to a mathematical understanding, right? Space is understood on the model of geometry and finally given by the axiomatics of, well, a Euclidean space under Newtonian science and time by the logic of arithmetic, right? Inner sense and outer sense, or respectively outer sense and inner sense, right? So with Kant, you have this kind of psychologistic Platonist, not only a kind of psychologized Aristotelianism, but a psychologistic Platonism, because what he does is inflect the forms, the mathematical forms, into the understanding, and specifically into sensibility. So the forms no longer become super sensible, quote unquote, principles or invariant structures that organize the visible world of being qua being um, and the realm of appearances, but they become, in fact, forms of intuition. Right. And I think this is incidentally, this is the reading of Plato that you get um, in neo-Kantianism as well. Uh, this in, in you know the, the revival of Platonism and neo-Kantianism, but also this is like the Reza reading. If you've read, of course, his own like sort of take on Plato in intelligence and spirit, he draws very heavily on this kind of neo-Kantian uh, uh, trajectory, and this is how he understands it. But I think it is important to always remember that for Plato, ideas are not psychological, right? Even if, as we have said, there is an isomorphy between the order of ideas and the ontological order, ideas are in fact not psychological categories, right? And yes, it's true that the forms and the ideas uh, are something like transcendental structures insofar as they determine the conditions of all possible particulars, right? They determine like their categorical structures insofar as they determine what it is that any particular you know, can happen to be. Without uh, the forms, uh, concrete par particulars would not be concrete, but they would be indeterminate, right? They would be completely amorphous or completely um, void of any qualitative specificity, right? But the key to understand why Plato cannot actually be uh, uh, endorsing a psychologistic account of the forms and why he is a you know, resolute anti-psychologist is because of the explicit theory of reminiscence, right? The theory of reminiscence is something that is going to point to us to the necessary postulation of something like uh, what in quote unquote Deleuzean parlance we can say is a pure past, a past that is not relative to the present of psychological, phenomenological experience, a virtual past, if you will, something where there is something uh, 
a realm of knowledge or wisdom that does not correspond to any lived experience, which is something very strange, but we'll get to that in a second. And in this same sense, we can understand this kind of search for the form of the good in analogy with a kind of non psychologistic search for what Kant was looking in the transcendental deduction, right? In the transcendental deduction, as you know, Kant is looking for a recipe to understand the commensurability between the faculties, between the understanding and sensibility, specifically through the mediating role of the imagination. And the search for the form of the good in the case of Plato is something like a principle of unity. It's a principle of synthesis. It's a principle that would enable a criterion of sort of transit between the different ideas and the different crafts and domains of knowledge, right? Which is, again, what I mentioned before, the systematic integrity of the dialectic, right? And this is the hymn of the dialectic. The hymn of the dialectic is the capacity to weave together more and more expansively the domain of the local into an ever more expansive universal horizon, right? And so here is the first uh, quote that I want to just like very briefly introduce, right? So here is the kind of beginning of the transcendental argument, right? And why it is that these transcendental forms, which are, again, the forms, cannot be understood in a psychological dimension. They are, in fact, impersonal, right? And this means that the soul, which is the recipient, which of course is already pregnant with these forms, cannot be equivalent to the empirical self. There is a distinction already almost equivalent to the modern distinction between subject and empirical self between the soul, which is the depository of wisdom, which is pregnant as it were with the forms, with the wisdom or knowledge of the form, and the empirical self, which undergoes experiences in time, which is a body which lives in the here and now. And the philosopher midwife, as you know from the Theotetus, has the job of giving birth, of making the soul give birth to the ideas that it had within itself. But when the soul investigates by itself, it passes into the realm of what is pure, ever existent, immortal and unchanging and being akin to this it always stays with it whenever it is by itself and can do so it ceases to stray and remains in the same state as it is in touch with things of the same kind so the soul is of the same kind as the forms right and its experience then is what is called wisdom when the soul and the body are together nature orders the one to subject and to be ruled and the other to rule and to be mass and be master. Then again, which do you think is like the divine and which like the mortal? Do you not think that the nature of the divine is to rule and to lead, whereas it is that of the mortal to rule, to be ruled and be subject? So here is where it is impossible to understand the theory of the forms as being psychologistic, because of course, it is not possible to say that simply we once knew the forms, but we just forgot them at some point in the chronology of our lives. Because for the most time, this is just empirically not the case, right? See, it's, it's not that the Atitius is just being reminded and he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to think that, you know, 50 days ago, I just happened to forget it because I was like, you know, too busy. Uh, with the war and everything else, right? It is something that takes us to a memory that corresponds to no lived experience. But this seems counterintuitive, right? This is where Bergson comes in, right? The idea of a memory that does not correspond to a former present. The idea of something like a past that was never present, a pure past, a past that was never present, but that can be actualized or brought into the present, even though, of course, in being born in the present, it is no longer pure, but it must be contaminated with the body and so on, or actualized, right? So what does this mean? This means that this process of giving birth 
to the idea, right, which is, of course, what the philosopher midwife is all about, concerns accessing this domain of a pure past, a time which was never actually present, but which becomes actualized by philosophical interrogation, by investigation. And let me just um, show you this quote. Uh, I had a much longer like uh, explanation about this, but this is the quote from uh, Laurel Lamascus. This is a very interesting explanation from the Phaedo, but I think this is where we get this connection between the process of catharsis and theory of recollection. In the Phaedo, the true philosopher is described as practicing for death. And this practice, insofar as it aims for the separation of the soul from the pollution of the body, is described as catharsis. The term catharsis itself has several applications, descriptive of the purification needed for the body for physical health, descriptive of the purification of both body and soul needed by initiates of mystery religions, and finally descriptive of the philosophical process by which the soul is purified of the confusion and misdirection that results from its communion with the body. We might then distinguish three senses of catharsis, medical, of the body, religious, and philosophical. Though Plato's sense of catharsis in the fate is primarily philosophical, it seems best understood in relation and arising from others. Evidence from both the Phaedo and the Sophists, as we'll see next week, shows that Plato applies the concept of catharsis to both body and soul. In the Sophists, Plato identifies catharsis as a kind of separation and distinguishes the purification of the body from that of the soul. In the Phaedo, Plato represents catharsis, presents catharsis as necessary for the proper attitude towards bodily pleasures as well as for the proper orientation of the soul toward the divine, suggesting both a kind of bodily catharsis and a spiritual intellectual. Each of the kinds of catharsis mentioned above requires a cleansing, and it is by means of this cleansing that a certain kind of health is achieved. That which cleans the physical leads to physical health, that which cleans the spiritual and intellectual to spiritual and intellectual health. In the Phaedo, Plato describes the catharsis, a catharsis that benefits the health of the soul, so that his description of the philosophical life is not limited to describing the life of the rational ego, but encompasses the desires and passions shared with animals, the passions singular to man in his aspirations to glory and fame, and the passion most singular to man in his desire for truth. Plato's presentation of catharsis in the Phaedo has three distinct aspects. It is necessary for the proper attitude towards bodily pleasures. It is necessary for the acquisition of pure knowledge and so for the proper orientation of the soul towards the divine. And three, it involves the practice and habituation of the soul, and so a way of life or bios, bios, of course. So this access and purification of the soul means that there must be also a kind of resolute anti-historicism involved in the theory of memory and in the theory of recollection. For if to purify the soul means to access this domain of forms which is uncontaminated by the body, then this domain cannot be subjected to the passage of time and therefore to the passage of history. And this is in fact Deleuze's reading, and this is how he models in the reconstruction in his own transcendental empiricist theory in the second synthesis of time in chapter two of Difference and Repetition by looking at the concept of reminiscence, which is recollection, right? Um, the very idea that what we get here is a kind of retrieval of a pure past, which is, of course, also an idea that you find in Burke's, right? The virtual totality of the past. And this is like a work of a transcendental memory, right? Transcendental, again, here no longer understood as merely the operation of a psychological ego or a psychological sort of, uh, you know, transcendental subject that accesses something that is, happens to be operative in the human mind. Here you have access to a kind of ontological past, a past that is not relative to the lived present of any human being or any living organism for that. And this is the final quote, and then is Theotitus. It is more or less at this point that Proust intervenes taking up the baton for Bergson. Moreover, it seems that the response has long been known, reminiscence. In effect, this designates reminiscence, a passive synthesis, an involuntary memory which differs in kind from any active synthesis associated with voluntary memory. Cambrai reappears, not as it was or as it could be, 
but in a splendor which was never lived, like a pure past which finally reveals its double irreducibility to the two presents which it telescopes together. The present that it was, but also the present present which it could be. Former presents may be represented beyond forgetting by active synthesis, insofar as forgetting is empirically overcome. Here, however, it is within forgetting, capital F, as though immemorial that Cambrai reappears in the form of a past which was never present, the in itself of Cambrai. If there is an in itself of the past, then reminiscence is its noumenon, or the thought with which it is invested. Reminiscence does not simply refer us back from a present present to former ones, from recent loves to infantile ones, from our lovers to our mothers, right? So here we have this idea that there is a noumenal kind of past or a noumenal autonomy forms. And this is going to be necessary to understand in when, especially once we get to the Formenians, when we get into the dialectic of why the one cannot be actually integrated into the flux of appearance. So again, there is a kind of work of transcendental memory where transcendental memory is no longer a psychological operation, right? Or it's no longer accessing simply a psychological Are we doing? Time? Oh shit! Um, wait, it ends right now, or do we have? have is it three? It was two hours and fifty minutes, or two hours and a half. Organizers, are you there? <laughs> wait, or anybody? We're out of time, or are we not? I think we are. I think it does end at four thirty, Daniel. Oh, okay. I thought. Am I tripping, or was it? It used to be until anyway i thought i had 20 minutes more um okay well the good thing is like right like let me just show you uh where we're going very quickly and then we'll we'll do uh this next time so um so that you can actually prepare for this because it's actually going to be very tough um this is very tough so obviously we are going to be talking about the theotitis and the most important thing to get, we're going to be talking about the Theotetus and the Sophos back to back. Uh, and I already told you what the pitch is, right? This is actually a critique of empiricism, and it is setting the foundations for a rationalist theory of knowledge, a theory, a, 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 a rationalist epistemology that would be an, an alternative to empiricist epistemology. And so in the dialogue, as you know, you go in three through three definitions. First, knowledge is defined as perception, then as true belief or, or judgment, and then finally as justified true belief or reason belief, right? Uh, true judgment with a logo, as it were. And what we're going to see, and this is what I want you to think about, is not only uh, the relationship of uh, em empiricism to sophistry, but what I mentioned before, which is the relationship between, hold on, let me, where is this? Right past it. The anti-philosophical trinity. Uh, in this dialogue, there is a kind of complicity that Plato diagnoses between Heraclitianism, sophistry, and empiricism. Heraclitianism as an ontological theory, sophistry as a rhetorical strategy, and empiricism as an epistemological and the problem with these three theories at the end of the day is that they lead jointly to a kind of both relativism in the realm of theory, but also to a destruction of meritocracy at the level of practice, namely democracy, <laughs> right? And we've seen that this is like a big problem for play, that the, the problem with the empiricist theory is that if pushed to the limits, it destroys the very idea that we can have a criterion of selection to decide between those who have truer perceptions or falser perceptions since truth is perception and man is the measure of all things. And Socrates is very clearly gonna say that if this is the case, then even in the, well, especially in the political domain, we essentially destroy the capacity to 
pull apart the wheat from the chaff, right? We pull apart and we destroy the capacity to select between rivals. And essentially we become hostage to the democratic mediocrity, the rule of the mob. So this is very, very um, important. That's what I want you guys to focus on for, for, for this, okay? I'm gonna be like diving right into that as soon as we get to that. Um, and we'll move rather quickly because um, this is all like just, I had to go through this sort of like rehearsal introductory stuff. And even then I had to rush, especially with this last like sort of transcendental stuff. Yeah. Any questions? Do you mind sharing the, the slides, the notes, especially if you still have the ones from, from part one? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So yeah. That would be yeah. so awesome. Great, great, fantastic. Okay, so uh, next week we do Sophus and Theotetus. We'll probably, we'll definitely finish Theotetus and we'll get through at least half of the Sophus. Okay, fantastic. All right, oh, and sorry, <laughs> before everybody, uh, and concerning, I think the, 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 the organizer just told me that his connection became a seal when he left. But um, concerning presentations and papers, you know the drill, right? Like everybody records presentation. It's not a very big class, so you don't have to do it in groups. You can do it like uh, individually. You can send it to me via email or upload it in whatever way you want at any point during the class about any of the materials yeah. during the class. And hold on. Uh, give me a second. Um, the, the organizer is sending me messages. Okay, uh, so yeah, so everybody can record a presentation and submit it in whatever means they prefer, okay, or um, um, you know, either upload it or send me a link to the cloud, whatever you want. And the paper, essentially, uh, you have up to two weeks after class to submit it, please, this time, like don't, don't, don't submit it like a month or two months later, because then I'm like with a semester on top of me and then it becomes just like a, problem to have to like coordinate all that stuff okay so try try to like submit the papers if, if, if you're doing that uh at, by two weeks after the, the seminars ended and yeah any questions no all right then then uh theatitas and selfless next time thanks so much daniel thanks okay. so much bye bye